Right, welcome to this video on carbohydrates. So let's get into it. So carbohydrates are composed of monomers bonded together to form polymers. In a carbohydrate, the monomer is known as a monosaccharide. There are two main types that you need to be familiar with, hexoses and pentoses. Hexoses are so-called because they um, have six carbon atoms that make them up. Hex means six. So here we have the three that you need to know about, glucose, fructose, and galactose. So if we take glucose as an example, the six carbon atoms are found here, carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, you don't need to know the full structure for any of these. And indeed, for fructose and galactose, you only need to know their names and what they go on to produce. Glucose, you do need to know a little bit more about their structure, but not in this much detail. You need to know this. You need to know that there are two types of glucose, alpha glucose and beta glucose. You can see that the only differences between alpha and beta are the arrangement of the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen atom bonded to carbon one. On alpha glucose, the hydroxyl group is found at the bottom, whereas in beta glucose, it's found at the top. Everything else is exactly the same. So if in the exam you are asked to draw these molecules, you need to draw exactly what you see on the screen here. So you need to draw this hexagon shape. You need to draw the groups on this side and this side. You need to draw this point up here, which represents carbon five and six, and you need to draw the oxygen here. Importantly, where you draw the bond down to the hydroxyl groups, you need to make sure that the bond goes to the oxygen atom, not to the hydrogen atom. As discussed previously, oxygen can form two bonds, so that's to the hydrogen and to this carbon. Hydrogen can only form one bond, and that is to the oxygen here. So if you draw the bond to the hydrogen, that will be incorrect. You can't even draw it to the center of this uh, group here. It needs to be directly to the oxygen. Okay, so get practicing drawing those. The second class of monosaccharides you need to know about are the pentoses. Again, you don't need to be able to draw them, you just need to know where they are found in organisms. So the two types are deoxyribose and ribose. Just out of interest, you can see that the only difference between these two molecules is ribose has a hydroxyl group here, whereas deoxyribose only has a hydrogen. Deoxy means uh, without an oxygen. Okay, let's talk about bonding. So here we've got two alpha glucose molecules. And here you can see that they have bonded together. Now the way this reaction works is the hydroxyl group on carbon one reacts with the hydroxyl group on carbon four here. They've been highlighted for you. Where these two react together, a water molecule is lost and the remaining oxygen that's left behind bonds together carbon one and carbon four. Now, because we've lost a water molecule, that means this must be a condensation reaction. And this bond that's left behind is known as a glycosidic bond. Key terms there to get used to. OK, so here we have alpha glucose reacting with alpha glucose to form maltose. This maltose, because we've got two monosaccharides, is known as a disaccharide. And that is the first disaccharide you need to know about. The second example you need to know is sucrose, which is made of glucose bonded to fructose. And the third example is lactose, which is glucose bonded to galactose. You do not need to be able to draw any of these. All you need to know is the name of the disaccharide and the monosaccharides that are used to produce it. You also need to know the type of reaction and the name of the bond. Right, what about if we have more than two bonded together? So more than two monosaccharides bonded together is known as a polysaccharide. Here we have an example where we have again alpha glucose bonded together and here you can see we have a long chain of alpha glucoses bonded together. Now because we have carbon one reacting with carbon four in this case this is known as a one four linkage and here we have a long chain molecule produced with one four linkages. Sometimes, though, we can form extra bonds off the side of the molecule where we have carbon one reacting with carbon six. This is then known as a one six linkage. So here this will form a long chain and this now forms a branch off that chain. Now you need to know when each of these are used in what types of molecules. So there's three molecules you need to be familiar with. Amylose and amylopectin, which collectively uh, produce starch. This is found in plants and glycogen found in animals. OK, so amylose, you can see, is this helical structure. This is simply made up of a long chain of 
alpha glucose bonded together with 1,4 linkages. The way it uh, bonds though, it changes the angle slightly. So this is where it produces this helical structure. Amylopectin on the other hand, as well as having these long chains of 1,4 linkages does have some of these branch points in there. So you can see here, this is a branch point. So this is uh, where carbon one has reacted with carbon six. And so we have this branch here. Glycogen uh, is very similar to amylopectin, but it has far more branch points in it. Right, okay, so what, what is the purpose, what is the use of these polysaccharides? So in a plant, let's say, for example, the plant has been photosynthesizing a lot, so it's synthesized a lot of glucose. It uh, is more useful for the plant to store the glucose as a polysaccharide, as starch, than it is to store it simply as glucose. The reason for this is, uh, well, there's lots of reasons. The first one is that Glucose affects the osmotic balance in the cell. It causes water to enter the cell. Uh, on the other hand, starch is inert osmotically, so it doesn't cause any water to enter or leave the cell. The second reason is that you can see this helical structure here with amylose means that this is a very com uh, compact molecule. So it means you can store a lot of glucose in a very small space. Uh, next is, importantly, you can see that uh, amylopectin is branched. This means that if the plant needs to access the glucose quickly, these branch points allow that to happen. So enzymes can work on the end of each branch point, allowing it to be broken down very quickly. Okay, so uh, the same is also true for glycogen. In an animal, if we've got excess glucose, the first thing we're going to store it as is glycogen. And so you can see that we've got a lot in a small space. We can break it down easily. It doesn't affect the osmotic balance of the cell. So lots and lots of reasons to store monosaccharides as polysaccharides. Storage, though, isn't the only function of polysaccharides. Here's our next example, cellulose. Cellulose is made up of lots of beta-glucose molecules bonded together. Now, what, uh, the, having beta-glucose instead of alpha-glucose produces an interesting property. So you can see here, this is our first beta-glucose here, and you can see that we have 1,4 glycosidic bonds again. But now what you should be able to spot is this second beta-glucose here is actually upside down. So this one is the right way up, then upside down, then the right way up, and then upside down again. So every other beta-glucose is inverted. What this means is, is that the cellulose chain is now perfectly straight. And it also means, um, because we're using beta-glucose, it actually uh, means that the arrangement of these hydroxyl groups gives it another important property. Now this property, if we line up many of these cellulose um, chains alongside each other, what we can now have is some hydrogen bonding between these chains because of these inverted um, beta-glucose molecules, every other one being inverted. So there's a, a hydrogen bond between this one and this one, hydrogen bond here, 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 which means down this full length of cellulose here, you can form a hydrogen bond between this monomer and every monomer next to it in the adjacent chain. Same is also true for this chain. So if we have lots of these chains of cellulose alongside each other, forming hydrogen bonds, then we start to produce a very, very strong molecule. Now, where you have these chains side by side, this is known as a microfibril. And it's actually microfibrils that are found wrapped around a plant cell that form the cell wall. So uh, what have we got here then? We've got long straight chains, we've got very strong chains. So this means that the cellulose wrapped around producing the cell wall is very, very strong. But you can see in this uh, uh, photograph here, actually the spaces between these microfibrils, so the cell wall is actually perfectly and fully permeable to anything that might need to enter or leave the cell. So we've got strength, but we have permeability. Okay, testing for carbohydrates. So there's two tests you need to know about. The first one is the Benedict's test. This is a test for a reducing sugar. You don't really need to know what that means, but it's essentially a test for glucose. So the Benedict's test, you have a Benedict's reagent. The Benedict's reagent is blue. You place your sample in the Benedict's reagent and then you boil it for about five minutes. 
After the five minutes, you should see a color change if there's any reducing sugar present. So it will start to change to green if there's a small amount of reducing sugar and then yellow and then to this brick red color. So brick red is the key term you're looking for for your color change. Now, if you have a sample that you suspect there is uh, some glucose in it, but perhaps it isn't in a reducing sugar form, so for example, sucrose, then you need to perform a, an initial test to start with or an initial experiment to start with. So the first thing you need to do is actually boil your sample in hydrochloric acid. That's going to break any glycosidic bonds between your reducing sugar and your non-reducing sugar. So it's going to break apart that sucrose molecule into glucose and fructose. After you've done that, you neutralize it with an alkaline and then you re-perform the Benedict's test. So boil in Benedict's solution for five minutes and look for a color change. The second test you need to be familiar with is uh, a test for starch. Now this is known as the iodine test. Uh, this is uh, iodine in potassium iodide down here. Uh, so it's normally a sort of orangey browny color. And if you add in your sample and if the starch present, then it will turn blue black. Right, these are all the key terms for uh, this topics so pause now if you want to take a note of those so loads of free resources available on my website pxsbiology.com if you found the video useful then please like subscribe and share